Thank you so much for staying with us all day today. I'm here with our um, expert panelists who are here to answer your questions at the end of the day. Before we want, we get started, I just want to say, you know, it's such a pleasure to do this virtually. I think initially in the pandemic, we were all sad to not get together in person, but we're able to reach so many more people by doing this virtually. We literally have people from, I think every state but one here today across the United States. We have people from other countries. And one of the reasons that we're able to put this on free for you is from donations from our participants. So if you feel inclined, please go to our donation page. You can do that on the website or here um, at the conference as well. Um, you know, every little dollar counts. So, um, but anyway, we're happy to be here and um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. Before I do that, I do wanna remind you that we're here to kind of answer your questions today and we're not gonna to get to every single question. But if you have a question, please type it in the, in the Q&A section. That's where you're gonna type your medical questions. And I will try and read as many as I can or kind of lump them together so that we can get your questions answered by our experts here. Hey, Trisha, so, yes. For all the questions that we don't have a chance to answer, we'll answer them on our blog on the website. Correct, yeah. So, so all the questions should be answered. They won't all be answered live, I should correct and say, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm going to call on our panelists to have them introduce themselves. I will start with Dr. Cynthia Stunkel, who has taught me everything I know about menopause. So well, I wanted to introduce oh, yourself. Sorry. Hi, Trish, and thank you so much. And congratulations to Steve and the other organizers for getting this together. I'm uh, Dr. Cynthia Stunkel. I'm an internist endocrinologist, women's health expert. And I thought if Steve could advertise this conference as a rock star, I could advertise it as a menopause queen because I've really <laughs> pretty much been involved with menopause my entire career. And um, it's just always interesting, always new things to learn and do. And so I'm happy to hear what your questions are and thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jamie Wallison. Hi, thank you. I'm Jamie Wallison. I'm a gastroenterologist in San Diego. And it's a pleasure to be able to, to participate today. And thanks everyone for putting this conference on. It's wonderful. I've known Steve or Dr. Edelman for quite a few decades. Uh, we went to medical school together. So uh, we go back a long way and I'm glad to be able to participate in any way that I can. I've always had an interest in the uh, gastrointestinal issues that occur within diabetes. So pleased to be here, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Eugene Wright. Hi, my name is Gene Wright. I'm an internist currently serving as the medical director for performance improvement at the Charlotte Area Health Education Center here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've spent most of my career, as, I, as Steve knows, as a country doctor in Southeastern North Carolina, where we see lots of patients with diabetes. And uh, diabetes has been more than an interest of mine, but I would say it's probably a passion in helping patients who are living with diabetes. I'm very happy to be here. Excellent. And the man who probably needs no introduction, Dr. <laughs> Steve Edelman. Thank you, Tricia. Well, most of you know me, um, Steve Edelman, founder and director of TCOID, and I work at University of California, San Diego. And I'm so thrilled to have my longtime friends here to help answer your questions. And, you know, I agree with you, Tricia. Uh, Cindy, I've heard many lectures by Cindy, and she is such a good lecture. I wish I had menopause. <laughs> I have, All right, I have ladies who are listening, we're going to hold them to that. I have, I have menopause. We'll talk about that yeah. later. Yeah, I know you're envious, but it doesn't really exist, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started with a question that I think a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of buzz about right now, given the times, and I think it's appropriate to kind of address it. And that is, um, somebody wrote, is the COVID vaccine effective in patients with diabetes? And we can kind of broaden this and say, what are you all telling all your patients about the vaccine and whether or not they should get it? Well, I'll start with that. You know, as a primary care clinician, and I saw the question in the chat box, uh, the question really is around whether or not people with diabetes have lower immunity. 
doesn't mean they have no immunity and they don't make, they do make antibodies. They absolutely should get uh, the uh, COVID vaccine and get it and, and really should be getting influenza vaccines each year as well. So yes, we strongly recommend that for all of our patients with diabetes. Mm -hmm. I'll throw a one liner in. They've done research on all these vaccines that are been tried in tens of thousands of people and people with diabetes respond just as well as people without diabetes. And we know people with both type one and type two are more at risk for having an adverse outcome if they do get COVID. So get your vaccine as soon as possible. Anyone you can get. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm not here as an expert, but I completely agree. I'm recommending it for all of my patients. And I think a lot of people are worried about side effects. And what I can say is, you know, the side effects that may last a few hours, if you even do have them, are certainly better than getting the virus itself. Um, okay, moving on to some taboo-ish topics here, which is our theme of the day. Um, you know, I see some questions here about, um, you know, is hard liquor better than beer for patients with diabetes? Um, we can answer that. And then I also see a question about marijuana and marijuana use for diabetics. Um, Jamie, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on this, um, because I know some patients who have gastroparesis, which is a complication of diabetes where, you know, you can get some nausea from the stomach not emptying can actually get some similar symptoms from, you know, overuse of marijuana. So I'm just curious if you have some thoughts on, you know, the marijuana side of things. Absolutely. I think marijuana can be looked at in many ways, like alcohol. If you yeah. drink a little bit of alcohol, it stimulates your appetite and it helps you a little bit. If you drink too much alcohol, what happens? You start vomiting and you get sick as a dog and it's really bad for your system. And marijuana is, is very similar. There's a condition, the technical term is called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which means that if you smoke too much marijuana, it can have a reverse effect and can cause chronic nausea and vomiting that's very similar to diabetic gastroparesis. It's a two-edged sword um, because a little bit of cannabinoid can help with nausea. In fact, we use cannabis all the time to help people with nausea. But when people are chronic habitual users, it can trigger the reverse, uh, the reverse effect. It's a very touchy subject because uh, it's hard to prove this condition, but we see it all the time. But it's mainly in younger individuals who really smoke a lot of marijuana, two, three, four, five times a day. Yeah, it's gonna, such an oh. interesting, it's such an interesting, um, like you said, I think everything, you know, is better and probably moderation than too much of one thing, right? Too much of Absolutely. a good thing. So yeah, Trish, I just wanted to say, my husband is a cardiologist, so I'm speaking just a little bit dinner table conversation, but there's no question that they see people in the ER who have um, issues with irregular heart rhythm and heart failure, almost acutely associated with smoking large amounts of marijuana. So I think folks need to be just aware and kind of cautious. And I think what uh, Dr. Olson said about uh, moderation is probably really important, but it's not just kind of mood and other things. It can affect organs we might not expect it to affect. Yeah, I, I'm gonna spend 15 seconds of our precious time with this story, but the, the party at the end of the year when we graduated medical school, uh, one of the classmates brought over a big tray of marijuana brownies and a big stack of them. And then this one guy, uh, Joe, I want to mention his last name. He went into psychiatry and he came and he just ate four or five of them. And then I got a call later from the UC Davis Medical Center emergency department. <clears throat> and he was there throwing up and they, and they asked what, what was in the brownies. <laughs> and, uh, at that point, I, 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 I don't know. I didn't really have one at the time, but yeah, too much of anything is not a good thing, but um, certainly the marijuana for people with chemotherapy and nausea is a good thing in a certain amount, and they give it to them as pills too. Absolutely, and just to touch on the alcohol, you know, whether or not, you know, hard alcohol certainly has liquor, as, as was put in the question, certainly has less carbs than beer by itself, but you know, most of the time people are drinking hard alcohol along with you know, mixers like Coke or you know, in a margarita or pina colada or something like that. So the answer to the alcohol question is kind of, it depends. Um, and I would just say without having time to get into too much detail, 
that, um, you know, you just want to pay attention to the amount of carbs and other effects of alcohol. We actually have a great talk on the, on the TCOYD website that you can watch on alcohol and diabetes if you want kind of a detailed information about that. Um, there's it's, quite, it's, yes. From my perspective, the problem with the harder alcohol in regards to the liver is that when you start drinking it, you wind up consuming a lot more at alcohol than you would if you're drinking beer or wine, just because the concentration of the alcohol is so much higher. So we do tend to see more organ damage to the liver related to the hard alcohols as compared to the others, although anything in excess can be dangerous. Yeah, that's like that's an excellent fashions. point. Yeah. Jamie, yeah. I like my old fashions. You just got to sip slow. Yeah. <laughs> Moderation is the key for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, you know, there are quite a few questions here about different diets. So kind of the buzzwords that we're hearing a lot about lately are the keto diet, plant-based diet, intermittent fasting. There's questions about all of these and they're all very popular these days. And one of the questions also touched on weight loss during a perimenopause period. So I'm curious of, of our panels, you know, various thoughts coming from different perspectives. You know, is there a diabetic diet? What are your thoughts on kind of these buzzwords? And then how does menopause affect our weight? Cindy, you go first, because I think that's, that's probably the most area where most people do not know much about. Yeah, people ask me, will I gain, you know, what about the weight gain with menopause? And I just say true true and terrible because there's no <laughs> question yeah. that it happens. But the best news, one of the best clinical trials I ever read about was conducted in Pittsburgh. And they said to women, you know, this is going to be happening and it's going to be coming up and you're in your mid or late 40s. So what if you actually tried to pay it forward? And what they encouraged them to do is pick up their lifestyle be exercising, be more mindful of their eating. And in this clinical trial, they could really keep women from gaining weight um, because otherwise uh, there's no question that our metabolism changes. And we have longitudinal studies now going for 20 years following women from before menopause to well after called the study of women across the nation, the SWAN study. It's a, uh, observational study, but it's NIH funded, it's really well done. And, and even if we don't gain weight, the other bad news is somehow it moves around on our bodies to places we would rather not have it. So a lot of women will notice they get some more abdominal fat uh, deposits. And of course we know that can get complicated with um, increasing insulin resistance and some of the other negative facts about abdominal obesity. So boy, if women are coming up on this transition, I would just really encourage you. I love this concept of, you know, nip it in the bud, pay it forward, and then be able to look back and go, wow, I made it through. I'm doing okay. I'm still me. And, um, you know, not worry so much about it, but be proactive to try to manage it. Eugene, you must see a lot of weight questions in primary care as well. Absolutely. And so it's interesting, many patients do come in with a lot of the fad diets and wanna know which one I recommend. I really stress upon them two things. It is portion size and how you prepare your food. You could eat almost anything you'd like if you're eating it in the proper proportions and in a small. So the first thing we start with is how big is the plate that you use? How many servings do you get? Are you getting your fruits and vegetables a day? Yeah, see, I had one patient one time that was consuming 5,000 calories a day. So her plate must have been that big. But the, the, the key is for them, for many of them, because of who they are, where they live, they can't always afford specialized diets. So I tell them to work with what you have, but just be mindful of how you prepare your food, no deep frying, and the portion size. You know what, um, uh, what I mentioned in our opening uh, introduction, the four of us, Schaefer, Tricia, Jeremy, yourself, is that people with type 2, uh, it's in the genetic makeup, not only to get type 2 diabetes, but also to get this thing called central adiposity. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's something that's in the genes. It's, you're, you know, it's predisposed. And that's why a lot of folks with type 2 have the, the large abdominal area. It's so frustrating for people. And even with weight loss, your arms and legs may get skinnier, but you may not lose that much of your abdominal 
part. And so we hear you, it's frustrating, but um, you know, I, I agree with your suggestions, Gene. Um, eat, eat the foods you like that you grew up with that's in your ethnic and personal backgrounds in moderation. Well, the, and the other thing about that, we don't focus on weight loss initially. We focus on eating better, eating better and moving more and the weight loss will come. We found that if we focus on the weight loss and people don't see what they expect to get in weight loss, they feel like they're a failure and they go back. So we really try to take the pressure off of losing weight, put it more on eating well and moving more. And I think a lot of patients don't, you know, for all you patients out there, you don't realize that we learn about this in medical school, but we don't talk about it that much, which is that you can have profound health benefits from just 5% of weight loss. So, you know, taking on, you know, I have to lose 50 pounds is pretty daunting, but even very, very small changes can have big effects. Um, Jamie, kind of piggybacking off of this and, and, and moving alongside, there's a question about fatty liver. And, um, you know, this is, I think, a really important topic for our patients with type 2 diabetes. There's a question asking if it can contribute to higher glucose. We know that the liver is responsible for morning high glucose in the morning, but any other comments on fatty liver and what our patients can do to, you know, avoid this? Sure, thanks. Um, you know, fatty liver and type 2 diabetes go hand in hand. In fact, I see many people with fatty liver who do not have diabetes yet, but are destined to develop it. It's the first sign that diabetes is brewing. There's insulin resistance and the fat gets driven into the liver. So the two go hand in hand. Um, you know, I taught the treatment for fatty liver really is is diet and exercise, which is what we've been talking about. And Jean made the comment, we're not looking for 50 pounds of weight loss. There are many studies that show even modest weight loss, just five or 10 pounds will improve your liver issues. Um, there are also studies that show if you just start to walk and you don't lose a pound of weight, the fat will come out of your liver. So it's an independent variable. And we're not talking running marathons. We're talking just take just walking a couple of times a week, and it will really drive the, the fat out of your liver. Uh, in regards to diet, one of the things that I think is helpful, whether it's the Mediterranean diet or it's you know a, a low-carb diet or whatever it is, if, if individuals can have a book, a guideline, something that they can really sink their teeth into, to follow a, a organized diet, they will do much better than what I can do with them, which is you know, telling them you need to lose weight, you need to use common sense, you need to eat less. They hear it and they shake their head, but it's really hard to follow up on that without some guidance. A trained dietitian and a formal weight loss program is also extremely valuable. It's just hard for people to get the time to put into that oftentimes. So. Can I just say one more yeah. thing about that? So the diabetes prevention program really had the same kind of goal that you all are talking about. I think people were asked and encouraged to lose about 7% of their body weight. And a lot of these were women. I think about 70% of them were women. And so that was really encouraging that a lot of people by that kind of minimal amount of weight loss could even sometimes turn the clock on having diabetes, that it would restore their metabolic health um, just by doing that. Um, people should check sometimes your local Y will have uh, programs that are um, designed after, after the diabetes prevention program so that they'll help with the very things you just said with um, nutritional advice and exercise programs. And it's, you know, it's available in your community and it's affordable. So that might be a way to get yourself in a program, make some friends, be able to do it, and um, really kind of make it happen instead of just going, okay, Monday morning, I'm going to try again. You know, I think it's so true. And I think, um, you know, these, the weight loss is such a taboo topic, I think, for people with type 2 diabetes. It's everyone feels, you know, we've all been there where we feel like we're failing, or we feel like we don't want to tell our doctors exactly what we're eating, or you know, tell them so much about our struggles. I think, you know, something that's come up quite a bit today is the two newer classes of um, medications to treat type two diabetes that actually can help us along with the weight loss. So there's a couple of um, 
questions in the chat box that talk about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, some people, it sounds like, can't take one or the other because they're afraid of injections or they have urinary tract infections. But what are you telling your patients about these medications? And you know, what do you do if you're afraid of injection and you want to take a GLP-1? Well, yeah. we do have an oral GLP-1 now. That's so, right, yeah. And uh, the, the weight loss with that has been really uh, striking. So there are options for them other than injections. But I, I point out to many patients in, in the era prior to GLP-1 and SGLT-2s, many of the weight loss clinics were giving injections weekly or have you taken, and many people didn't have a problem with that if they thought they were getting the result that they wanted. So it's often not the fear of the injection. Uh, it's often what's in it uh, for the patients that I see. Right. Yeah, and I, I can add on, you know, the name of that drug is Rebelsis. There's no reason why we can't mention it. Um, the GLP-1s, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. And, I, and Dr. Santos, Tricia, you gave a good lecture on that. I mentioned it in my opening talk too. And uh, the GLP-1s, the, they're once weekly, but they do have, uh, some of them have auto injection. You never even see the needle. Um, it's like an EpiPen. And, you know, you start low and you go slow and it does help induce satiety which is which basically as you sit down to a meal, you might be super hungry, but then all of a sudden you get full faster. And every single study shows that people lose the weight. And SGLT2s is the oral medication. They lead to weight loss as well. And um, you know they're not really, uh, at least in the doses approved by the FDA, they're not officially weight loss drugs, but they will help you lose weight. I wanted to mention one quick thing, and I'll let you get back to moderating, Tricia, that you know, uh, Jamie was talking about walking and exercise and people should know that muscle weighs two and a half times of the amount of fat so you might be exercising and building your leg muscles you might be doing some cardio with weights and things and your weight may not change at all don't get discouraged because because that uh that muscle mass is quite heavy but it's also is healthy too yeah absolutely i think those are all great tips and you know it's so nice that we now have medication that gives us additional benefits besides, you know, just helping out with the diabetes. Um, kind of going back to the menopause question here, um, there is a question about kind of being on a roller coaster, um, having diabetes going along the menopause roller coaster. And I'd like to hear from um, many of you, we'll start with Cynthia, but you know, how do other things in your life, such as menopause, but there's other things in life, other life stressors and things affect your diabetes? And what do you tell your patients about kind of how those go hand in hand? One of the things I said in my lecture was that, and I'll tell you, Steve, I've learned more about diabetes and menopause from talking to women many, many years of your take control um, because there's some things that people experience that just aren't really written in the studies of the textbooks. And a lot of women would say to me, I can't tell if I'm having a hot flash or if I'm going low, if my blood sugar is dropping. And so that was one of the first things that really just resonated with me that that would be kind of terrifying because no one ever teaches us this is what a hot flash is gonna feel like. Now you're having a hot flash. And plenty of women are confused and don't necessarily recognize. They think they're having an anxiety attack or something else is happening when they first start. So the first thing I would just advise is that just women get comfortable. If It'd be great if they have continuous glucose monitoring, but if they have to be checking it, at least for those first few go rounds until they can really distinguish between having hot flashes starting and having their blood sugar go low. So that, that would be an important thing. As far as managing, and it is true that I think the, I call it the portal to the second half of life, but in many ways, it's like a crucible. Your parents are getting old and you have to help take care of them. Your kids, depending, I was a late bloomer. So I had a teenager when I was going through menopause. So I said to my husband, he goes, what's happening in our household? And I said, maybe you should just leave and come back in a few years when our daughter's <laughs> completed puberty. And I had gotten through the menopause. But you just have to just, I think it helps to say, okay, I know what's happening. I know what's going on. 
there's going to be issues of all sorts in life. It's kind of a compressive time, but just, you know, I'm going to get through this. It's going to evolve. I don't think anyone ever dies of menopause. Uh, you might feel like you wish you could sometimes, but nobody's, we don't lose anybody. And so just having, I think, a, again, a positive perspective that this, I'm going to be able to move on and just use whatever tools are available to help with um, how you do stress relief without, you know, overeating, drinking too much, doing other things. We talked about marijuana earlier that will actually be harmful while you try to kind of reduce your stress a little bit. But, um, and then if you need to, from the menopause standpoint, you know, getting help with the symptoms, that can be huge. So we can. Uh, thanks, Cindy. I, your, your comments made me ask Jamie, does a woman's GI tract change during menopause? And if it does, it's probably going to affect the diabetes. And my that last would be comment, true. My last comment about this is that um, you know everyone responds to menopause and uh, menstrual periods differently. And I think you mentioned it, Cindy. CGM is is really the best way to try to stay off the roller coaster. So, you know, I, I kind of along these similar lines. Um, there was a question here about men's sexual health, and we've been talking about some women's sexual health topics. Um, you know, is, and the, the question was about erectile dysfunction and is it normal to have erectile dysfunction at age 75? And I'll kind of broaden that to, to maybe ask, you know, <laughs> how does erectile dysfunction kind of correlate with patients with type 2 diabetes? Does it put them at risk? It's abnormal not to have erectile dysfunction at 75. So, so having <laughs> diabetes puts you at a significant increased risk of erectile dysfunction. However, I counsel patients that taking control of your diabetes, keeping it well managed early will actually help you in the long run. Mm -hmm. And again, one of the things you find when you listen to patients is you understand what is important to them. So in the motivational interviewing, for many men, that, that resonates with them. So if you give them some hope from the long run with the things that they have to do today, it works out much better. Gee, even if that's not true, I'm glad you say that. <laughs> Could I say one thing about it that kind of links our stories together? Um, when I talk to mixed groups, so uh, of clinicians, of doctors and practitioners, I just always ask them, please, if they're going to help their male patients with erectile dysfunction and deliver the little blue pill or whatever flavor they prefer, that they remember that there's a partner at home. And depending on the age of that partner and how much action there has or been not been going on in the bedroom, they might want to give that partner time to gear up, um, in my case with women, to gear up uh, her vaginal health, because she might have issues with vaginal dryness and discomfort that could be remedied. And the little blue pills can act pretty fast for women to get them up to speed. It's going to probably take a few weeks. So um, let's be generous with our partners and make sure that we convey that in our um, enthusiasm to help the men along in, um, in their condition also. Cindy, did you, did you say the female should be taking the uh, ED drugs that are approved for men? Did I hear no, that? I'm saying that a woman might need a little vaginal estrogen or there are a number of other products. Right. Maybe it's just even being made aware of uh, over-the-counter moisturizers like every day and then lubricants with intercourse. But it's really kind of a tough situation when he, he comes home ready to play and she's going, yeah, this is not going to be fun for me because it's uncomfortable. And that never ends to a happy ending to that romantic um, interlude. So just so everybody's happy, it gets on the same page. I, get I it. think that would be helpful. Yeah, those are such good points that I think we don't, you know, all of these topics today are things that we don't really normally think about, you know, and I think, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll kind of go back to the chat here before I start talking too much myself, but these, you know, I am seeing some questions about diabetic neuropathy and um, maybe we'll start the kind of two questions here. I think a lot of people think about diabetic neuropathy with numbness and tingling in your feet um, and maybe in your hands, but there's another kind of diabetic neuropathy that can cause um, gastroparesis, which we mentioned. Um, so I'll pose two questions. Jamie, do you want to talk to us a little bit about gastroparesis and your thoughts? And then 
Um, to the larger group, you know, the, there was a question about kind of prevention of diabetic neuropathy. Are there supplements people can take? Um, what should they be doing? Because even though it's not, you know, maybe one of the scariest um, side of, or, you know, complications of diabetes, it certainly can impact your life quite a bit. Sure. Thanks, Tricia. Um, diabetic gastroparesis is not a very common problem nowadays. I would say 20, 30 years ago when control of diabetes was a lot uh, worse, a lot less aggressive treatments at that time, we saw more and more complications of gastroparesis. And gastroparesis is a condition where there's basically neuropathy of the stomach and it doesn't empty properly. It usually causes symptoms of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, it's not real common, but we do still see it, especially in people who've had poor control of their diabetes early on. Uh, we haven't made a whole heck of a lot of progress in treating gastroparesis. It's better to try to prevent it than to treat it because the, there haven't been that many new medications that have come out for it. But the mainstay of treatment is smaller meals, uh, agents that stimulate the stomach like metoclopramide or Reglan. And there is a new medication that has been approved uh, called Motegrity or Prucalipride. It's approved for constipation, but it also stimulates the stomach. What I see more of is constipation. Chronic constipation is very common and it can be related to neuropathy much like gastroparesis can, but more often than not, it's, it's not directly related to the diabetes. It's just a, a very, very slow colon. It tends to worsen with menopause. I saw a question regarding that earlier. Um, and we typically treat that with higher fiber diets, mild laxatives, and then there are pharmaceutical agents that will help stimulate the colon as well. Could I, could I make a comment? Well, Jamie's helped me and, you know, this is a taboo day. So, you know, it's not that fun talking about your own constipation. And, um, you know, we've tried everything in the book and I have not tried that new medication, but you guys are going to think this is a joke, but it's not. Um, I, I saw this video about a, a device called the Squatty Potty. And you, you, it goes in front of your toilet and you put your feet up on it. And I ordered mine from the Squatty Potty place, uh, but you, so you can get it at Target now. And that, uh, that alignment with your knees up, um, it does help quite a bit. But I would say that the thing that bothered me the most is, is the constipation, you know? So I, I, and that's, you know, cause I know the GI tract is stimulated by the nervous system as well. So. Thank you for your help, Jamie. I, I got, I'm on other medications. Uh, so, so far everything's good. Yeah. I think that's so important because I think patients don't realize, Jamie, these common symptoms that you're talking about could in fact be related to their diabetes. That's, that's probably a big eye opener for a lot of patients out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Steve, thank you for pointing out the, the squatty potty. I mean, much of the constipation that we see is related to malfunction of the floor of the pelvis. And it's just difficult for people to actually push properly. Uh, and this worsens with menopause, it worsens with previous childbirth. Uh, women tend to be afflicted with this more frequently than men because of that. Uh, but the Squatty Potty is a simple device that, that puts the, it straightens out the, uh, the angle between the rectum and the colon and allows the bowel movements to occur without straining so much. And that, that company has the most awesome, cutest video uh, about it. It's like a cartoon thing. And they were, on, they were on Shark Tank and that's how they got funded originally. No way. Yeah, I didn't it's, it has a song and it's, it, <laughs> it, it's not as good as the rock and roll song, but it's pretty close. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very well done and it, it is a super common problem. Any other comments on neuropathy from the panel? Otherwise, I'll move on. Just a quick comment. Uh, in many of the patients with type 2, particularly if they've been on metformin for over five years, I always like to check a B12 level before I ascribe something to diabetic neuropathy. And we picked up a few people who have been B12 deficient, and we're able to pick that up uh, early on. Yeah, that's such an important point. And somebody actually did put that in the in the question box that metformin can um, decrease your absorption of that vitamin. So it's important to have that checked, you know, over the long term. So great. Um, 
We only have a couple minutes left. So I think I'll move on and just have you all kind of give us your parting words of wisdom. And, and what I'd like to say that I hope the patients take away from this is just, there's a lot of taboo topics here that we've discussed throughout the whole day today. And I hope you see how comfortable everyone on our panel is with bringing up even words that are hard to say. And I think that you as patients should feel really comfortable talking to your healthcare providers about these issues because we've heard it all before. Um, so I'll leave you with that. And why don't, why don't you each, you know, tell us your parting words. Let's start with um, Eugene, why don't you start? Okay, well, I, I have two parting words, one for the clinicians that may be on the, on the video and one for patients. For the clinicians, what I've learned from patients over the years is that I need to listen to understand and not listen to respond. To the patients, I say that diabetes is a journey, not a destination. So that along that, along that path, you're gonna have some ups and downs, but you're gonna make it. So I guess that would be my parting words. I love it. Jamie. Um, I think as one comment I would make is that as a gastroenterologist, I see many people with diabetes and without diabetes. I think that it's important to know that GI problems are very common. Probably 70% of people will have GI troubles along the way. And diabetics are prone to certain unique problems uh, in the GI tract related to their diabetes and also related to their medications, metformin causing diarrhea. Some of the GLP-1s can cause nausea or vomiting or bloating. So always be aware of that. And you know, it's important to have a dialogue about not only about the diabetes, but about uh, medications, about general lifestyle effects. And then one final thing is about the fatty liver issue. And, th and there was a, com a question in the comment area uh, Fatty liver is really epidemic for us right now. Probably more than half of the population has it. It can lead to more serious problems such as cirrhosis, and it's also driving a, uh, an increase in liver cancer. So it's important to, if your liver enzymes are high, even if you don't have diabetes, realize that it can be the precursor to that and try to take some steps to alleviating that situation. So important. Yeah, I think so many times we think of diabetes just related to the sugars and we talk so much about the heart, um, you know, but these are such excellent points that you can have diabetic complications, medication side effects and effects of uncontrolled diabetes, um, you know, on the liver and, and the GI system. So excellent. For those of you that got scared to death by Jamie's comments, which are true, you can listen to Bill Pulaski, who's our clinical psychologist to help you deal with that stress. Uh, Jamie, you always uh, are so knowledgeable and I really appreciate that too, but it is something to take seriously for sure. Yeah. Cynthia. Yes, yeah, so what I wanted to encourage, when, I'm gonna just speak to the menopause thing. What I wanna encourage women to do is to be bold. I talked to Steve a lot of years ago. I said, I wanna do a take control of your menopause because uh, <laughs> women need to do more of that. I saw an article that was a, a big survey that was conducted by AARP. And they concluded that three out of four women who come in for help with menopause kind of leave empty handed. In my book, that's not good enough. And so whether you're having, um, say you feel like you're having dry vagina or you're having difficulty with intercourse, Believe it or not, your provider might be embarrassed to bring these questions up. I'm always saying to doctors, just ask. If it's not your specialty, then you can go ahead and refer your patient, but get it out on the table because often women are so relieved. But if you have a shy provider, then you can help them out. So be bold, say what's on your mind, say what you need, and then don't be afraid to get a second opinion. If it's not happening for you, we have so many things to ease our way through menopause. So that if you're feeling like it's not happening, please just take control of your menopause. In other words, be a rock star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or menopause, yeah. a menopause queen. Or a menopause queen. <laughs> Steve, any last words of wisdom in the last couple of seconds here? You know what? I, I think you guys uh, really said it all. And I, I, I would just echo that it's about communication. And yeah. what you said, Cindy, was so right. 
your, your caregiver is not going to get embarrassed if you tell him or her about menopause problems or ED problems. And many of your, many of your providers are so busy and they got yeah. their backed up. Just make sure when you walk in the room, you have your little sheet, not too many questions, but just say at a time that's good during our visit, may I please ask you about uh, some questions that are bothering me. So it, it's all about trust on the side of the patient. You trust your caregiver and on the caregiver side, as Jean mentioned, you know, you got to listen and have a lot of empathy. I think that's Can I 15 more question. seconds, Trish? Um, the other thing for women, I know you're so busy taking care of all the details with your diabetes. Remember your mammogram. Remember, depending on your history, to get your pap smear. Don't stop doing your self-care kind of things just because you hit middle age or hit menopause. Keep taking care of all those things that you've been doing all along. That's so great. Thank you so much. This was a great panel. I learned a lot myself and we all appreciate you being here. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Get, ready for, the, get ready for the rock song. <laughs>